He's conscious of all manifestations. He is directly and indirectly conscious of all manifestations. And he's independent because there's no other cause behind him. It is he only who first imparted the Vedic knowledge into the heart of Brahmaji, the original living being. By him, even the great sages and demigods are placed into illusion. as one is bewildered by the illusory representation of water seen in fire or land seen on water. Only because of him do the material universes, temporarily manifested by the reactions of the three modes of nature, appear factual, although they are unreal. I therefore meditate upon him, Lord Sri Krishna, who is eternally existent in the transcendental abode which is forever free from the illusory representations of the pure world. I meditate upon him, for he is the absolute. Dharma Pujita Kaitra Vodra Paramo Nirmatsaranam Satam Vedyam Vastava Matra Vastu Sivadam Tapa Trayonmu Imad Bhagavate Mahamuni Krite Kimba Purir Ishwaraha Sadyohidi Aburudya Tetra Piti Bihi Susu Sabistakshana Completely rejecting all material activities, all spiritual activities, all religious activities which are materially motivated. This Bhagavata Purana propounds the highest truth which is understandable by those devotees who are fully pure in heart. The highest truth is reality distinguished from the illusion for the welfare of all. Such truth uproots the threefold miseries. This beautiful Bhagavatam compiled by the great sage Vyasadeva in his maturity is sufficient in itself for God-realization. What is the need of any other scripture? As soon as one attentively and submissively hears the message of Bhagavad by this culture of knowledge, the Supreme Lord is established within his heart. Mohur aho raska bhuvibhavakaha. O expert and thoughtful man, relish Srimad Bhagavatam. The mature fruit of the desire to Vedic literatures. It emanated from the lips of Sri Sukadeva Goswami. Therefore this, this, uh, therefore, this fruit has become even more tasteful. Even though its nectarian juice was already relishable for all. Including liberated souls. Shinvatam Svakata Krishna Punya Shravana Kirtana Hiriantaksto Badrani Vidunati Srihit Satam. To hear about Krishna from Vedic literatures or to hear from him directly through the Bhagavad Gita. Is, is itself righteous activity. And for one who hears about Krishna, Lord Krishna, who is dwelling in everyone's heart, acts as a best-wishing friend and purifies the devotee who constantly engages in hearing of him. Nasta presu badresu nityam bhagvata sevaya Bhagavati Uttama Sloke, Bhaktir Bhaviti Naistaki, 
In this way, a devotee naturally develops his dormant transcendental knowledge. As he hears more about Krishna from the Bhagavatam and from the devotees, he becomes fixed in the devotional service of the Lord. By development of devotional service, one becomes freed from the modes of passion and ignorance. And thus, material lusts and avarice are diminished. Evam prasana manaso bhagavat bhakti yogitaha bhagavat tattva vigyanam mukta sangha sijayate. When these impurities are wiped away, the candidate remains steady in his position of pure goodness. Becomes enlivened by devotional service and understands the science of God perfectly. Vidyate hridaya grantis chidyante sarvasam saya chidyante chasya karmani krista evatmani shwari. Thus, bhakti yoga severs the hard knot of material affection. and enables one to come at once to the stage of a samsayam samagram, understanding of the supreme absolute truth personality of Godhead. Canto 1, Chapter 15, Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 1, Chapter 15, text number 34. Yaya Harad Bhuvo Bharam Tam Tanum Vijahav Aja Kantakam Kantake Neva Dwayam Kapisitu Samam Translation by Srila Prabhupada. The Supreme Unborn, Lord Sri Krishna, caused the members of the Yadu dynasty to relinquish their bodies, and thus he relieved the burden of the world. This action was like picking out a thorn with a thorn, through both, uh, though both are the same to the controller. Purport by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. Srila Vishwanath Chakrati Thakura suggests that the Rishis, like Sonaka and others who were hearing Srimad Bhagavatam from Sutta Goswami at Naimisharanya, were not happy to hear about the Yadus dying in the madness of intoxication. To give them relief from the mental agony, Sutta Goswami assured them that the Lord caused the members of the Yadu dynasty to relinquish their bodies by which they had to take away the burden of the world. The Lord and his eternal associates appeared on earth to help the administrative demigods in eradicating the burden of the world, and therefore called for some of the confidential demigods to appear in the Yadu family and serve him in his great mission. After the mission was fulfilled, the demigods, by the will of the Lord, relinquished their corporal, corporeal bodies by fighting amongst themselves in the madness of intoxication. The demigods are accustomed to drinking the Soma Rasa beverage, and therefore the drinking of wine and intoxication are not unknown to them. Sometimes they were put into trouble for indulging in intoxication. Once the sons of Uvera, fell in the wrath of Narada for being intoxicated. But afterwards, they regained their original forms by the grace of the Lord, of the Lord Shri Krishna. 
we shall find this story in the 10th canto. For the Supreme Lord, both the Asuras and the demigods are equal, but the demigods are obedient to the Lord, whereas the Asuras are not. Therefore, the example of picking out a thorn by another thorn is quite befitting. One thorn, which causes pinpricks on the leg of the Lord, is certainly disturbing to the Lord. And the other thorn, which takes out the disturbing elements, certainly gives service to the Lord. So although every living being is a part and parcel of the Lord, still one who is a pinprick to the Lord is called an Asura, and one who is a voluntary servitor Lord is called a devata, or demigod. In the material world, the devatas and the suras are always contending, and the devatas are always saved by the hands, uh, from the hands of the suras by the Lord. Both of them are under the control of the Lord. The world is full of two kinds of living beings, and the Lord's mission is always to protect the devatas and destroy the asuras wherever there is such a need in the world, and to do good to both of them. <clears throat> well, the idea of doing good to both of them, that's uh, an important point. That's also explained in the... Second verse of Shimad Bhagavatam. The highest truth is reality distinguished from an illusion for the welfare of all. So that for the welfare of all distinguishes Krishna consciousness from all other welfare work. Usually welfare work is done with some selfish purpose. That is like, for example, you have certain charities that benefit only certain ethnic groups. And you have certain charities that only benefit certain racial groups. And you have certain charities that only benefit certain national groups. So that's, that's not, I mean, that's some kind of welfare work but it, there's a selfish purpose behind it. But Krishna's welfare work is for the welfare of all. So here, Krishna is always acting in the welfare of all, not just one group or another group. He sees equally the Adus and the Asuras, but he, re he rewards each according to their uh, consciousness. So, uh, this, this uh, example of one thorn taking another thorn out is very important because he uses the, uh, says here, one thorn which causes pinpricks on the leg of the Lord is certainly disturbing to the Lord, and the other thorn which takes out the disturbing elements certainly gives service to the Lord. So although every living being is a part and parcel of the Lord, still one who is a pinprick to the Lord is called an asura. And one who is a voluntary servitor of the Lord is called a devata or demigod. So even though in the material world, uh, the devatas and asuras are always you know, fighting, but the devatas are always saved uh, from the, uh, the onslaughts of the asuras by the Lord. Both of them, Prabhupada says, are under the control of the Lord. So the Lord's mission is to always protect the devatas and destroy the asuras whenever there is such a need in the world and to do good to both of them. So that's the welfare of all, to do good to both of them. So this is kind of hard to, for people to understand. They think, well, he rewards one and punishes the other. How is that equal? Well, because 
just like a father, you might have a good son and a bad son. Or like in the Bible, the story of the prodigal son. So although the father uh, obviously is pleased by the good son, but he'll give special attention to the bad son to try and save him. So, uh, so we see in, in the, the uh, story or the, the, uh, the story of the prodigal son in the Bible, uh, one son always stays faithful to his father, always stays with his father, always takes his father's advice. And the other son leaves, squanders whatever his father gave him, and uh, once he's exhausted and defeated, comes back. And the father greets him with a great festival and gives him special attention. And, and the loyal son says, well, father, you, you never did this for me. But the idea is that uh, the father has equal, let's say, appreciation for both sons in the sense that, well, in the sense that they're like part and parcel of him in a sense. So it's even more so in the case of Krishna, where all living entities are part and parcel of the Lord. And the Lord's desire is that everyone come back to Godhead. Why should they be suffering in the material world? So, uh, even though the, the Asuras will be defeated, even in their defeat, they're still awarded liberation. So, these are difficult things to understand for ordinary people because they want vengeance. But for devotees, all of this is just more reasons to glorify the Lord because he has uh, unfathomable mercy for all living it. Okay, so his, his punishment is also mercy. It's to educate someone to stop committing sinful activities. So everything the Lord does is merciful. But some people understand it and some people don't. So another point here is that uh, some of the confidential demigods appeared in the Yadu family and served the Lord in his great mission. After the mission was fulfilled, the demigods, by the will of the Lord, relinquished their corporeal bodies by fighting amongst themselves in the madness of intoxication. And then Prabhupada says, the demigods are accustomed to drinking soma rasa beverage. And therefore, the drinking of wine and intoxication are not unknown to them. So, Somarasa is a type of intoxicating drink that, if when you drink it, it can prolong, prolong your life 10,000 years. And don't ask me, I don't know the formula for, for the recipe for Somarasa, but uh, <laughs> I know where you can find it. It's on the moon. You want to be one of the first SpaceX uh, voyagers to go to the moon, which is not possible. So don't even try it. You, you won't, the, it won't succeed. If you do want to go to the moon, then you have to uh, worship Chandra, the uh, demigod of the moon. But why would you want to go there? It would just increase your stay in the material world. Better to Go back to Godhead. So you don't need to worship Chandra, you just worship Krishna. Okay, so are there any questions? Uh, what do you mean by that? Uh, 
Well, that phrase, all living entities are created equal, that's from the Declaration of Independence, not Bogley. Unless you know where it is, Bogley. Well, that, that means that Krishna is equal to everyone. It doesn't mean that, see, first of all, all living entities are not created. They are eternal. That's why I say that's a phrase in the Declaration of Independence. Uh, it's not, I don't, I don't know. I mean, if, if you know where it is, you show me. In the Bhagavad Gita, it says all living entities are created equal. Uh, uh, let, let, let's get one thing straight. The soul is eternal, not created. The only thing that seems to be created is the body. And, but the body is created based on karma. So you can't say everyone created equal. Uh, in the material world, no one is equal. Everybody has a different karma. The soul is eternal so uh, whether you're you're a good person or a bad person you have an eternal soul and eternal that soul is part and parcel of krishna but the body you have is not the same every body is different why the some souls fall down yeah, okay, but I was just trying to point out that you can't say everyone is created equal. Well, that, that's explained in the 16th chapter. Daivi Sampad Vimokshaya Nirvanda Yasuri Mata Na Sucho Sucha Sampadam Daivim Abhijato Sipandava. Krishna is telling Arjuna, the transcendental qualities are conducive to liberation, whereas the demoniac qualities make for bondage. Do not worry, O son of Pandu, for you are born with the divine qualities. And the purport prophet says, Lord Krishna encouraged Arjuna by telling him that he was not born with demoniac qualities. His involvement in the fight was not demoniac because he was considering the pros and cons. He was considering whether respectable persons such as Bhisma and Drona should be killed or not. So he was not acting under the influence of anger false prestige or harshness. Therefore, he was not of the quality of the demons. For a Kshatriya, a military man, shooting arrows at the enemy is considered transcendental, and reframing from such a duty is demonia. Therefore, there is no cause for Arjuna to lament. Anyone who performs the regulative principles of the different orders of life is transcendentally situated. So we can see not everyone is born equal. He's saying, Arjuna, you're born with divine quality.
Yes. Well, well it, it depends what you're attracted to. Like, for example, uh, I bet I bet you have you you you've seen also. There are some devotees who started out really good, and later on they fell down. Why did they fall down? See that. So the answer is what they would not have fallen down after joining Krishna consciousness, if they uh, were perfect. But the, the, what is imperfect is the tendency to be attracted to sense gratification. Because that tendency happened originally. That's why, every, that's why some people fell down, like one-fourth of the creation fell down from the spiritual world because the, the, because of free will that tendency to be attracted to material nature is possible because they didn't divert their attention away from Krishna whereas uh, some people diverted their attention away from Krishna out of negligence and they fell down. And that's happening today also. We see people join Krishna consciousness and later on they fall down. It wouldn't be possible unless it happened previously. There are people that never fall down because they never diverted their attention from Krishna. But the people that fell down diverted their attention from Krishna became attracted to something in the material world that seemed attractive. And, and they're still falling down. Even after they join Krishna consciousness in this world, there are people that still fall down because that tendency is... Now, if you look at uh, the different types of... Uh, reactions, sinful reactions. Uh, let's say, uh, well, first, it all begins with the tendency to be attracted to sin. The subtle thing that goes, comes with people in the material world. And because of bad association, they become attracted, and then they commit a sinful act, and then there's a period where the reaction is, is unseen, aparabdha, and then it became, becomes manifest, aparabdha. And when it becomes manifest, uh, it, it begins as bad dreams and strong desires for sense gratification, and it, and it goes further where you have financial problems, or you have uh, legal problems, or you can have a uh, disease, or something like that. Or you could be born with a congenital problem, like a heart valve that doesn't work. You're destined to die soon. So, uh, and then uh, after suffering those the reactions, what remains is the tendency to be attracted to sin. And you die with that tendency, and the next time you take birth, it's still there. And, and you can either repeat the process, or you can finally give it up by engaging in Krishna consciousness and devotional service and not being attracted by sense gratification because you're all fully engaged in devotional service.
Well, what happens when the soul, when the jiva falls down? His soul is not corrupted. It's just covered. Yes, because the soul is always pure. It can't be corrupted. There's no chemical combination that takes place between soul and matter. But the matter covers it. Or the, or the desire for sense gratification covers consciousness. Uh, of, the, of the soul and therefore one begins to you know one becomes just like you drop your ring in the toilet and you flush the toilet well it becomes covered with water and stool and now it's going to be very hard to find it because you already flushed it right so you'd have to go to a sewer to try and find the ring and now it's going to be covered not just with a little bit of water it's going to be covered with a lot of water and stool so, but once you find the ring, it's not contaminated. Gold ring, it's not contaminated. Just wash it and put it back on your finger. Well, the Lord, Lord, the Lord doesn't have a pastime of falling down. Yeah. Okay. Now, look. Let me read. Let me read this. This will settle it. it says, this. I previously I read sixteenth chapter, verse five. Now, sixteenth chapter, verse six. Krishna says, "O son of Prita, in this world there are two kinds of created beings. One is called divine, and the other, demoniac." I have already explained to you at length the divine qualities. Now hear from me of the demoniac. So in the purport, Prabhupada says, Lord Krishna, having assured Arjuna that he was born with the divine qualities, is now describing the demoniac qualities. The conditioned living entities are divided into two classes in this world. Those who are born with divine qualities follow a regulated life. That is to say, they abide by the injunctions and scriptures and by the authorities. One should perform duties in the light of authoritative scripture. The mentality is called divine. One who does not follow the regulative principles as they are laid down in the scripture and who acts according to his whims is called demoniac or asuric. There is no other criterion but obedience to the regulative principles of the scripture. It is mentioned in the Vedic literature that both the demigods and the demons are born of the prajapati. The only difference is that one class obeys the Vedic injunctions and the others, other does not. So this is why it's so important not to send your kids to public schools because they're going to be taught not to obey. That, that's the whole theme of public schools, not to obey spiritual authority, that you have a right to speculate, you have the right to figure things out on your own, and that is uh, the proper way to live life. Not not accept any uh, not not accept any scriptural authority. You can if you want, but uh, that's not scientific, and it's not the truth. It's just a belief. You see, so that's what they teach you in school. So by sending your kid to school, you're actually abusing them. Yeah, it's a slaughterhouse. It's nonsense. So anyway, uh, you see, so the difference between a demon and a devotee is, is the devotees follow the rules and regulations. They have faith in God. And the demons don't. They don't follow the rules. And that's exactly what happens to kids. By the time they get out of, you know, 12, 18 years of school, they don't follow the rules anymore. Huh? Ready? I have a class now. We'll, we can discuss tomorrow. Yes. You can look up some. <laughs>
But my point is, we're not all born equal. That's 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 not. If you can find where it says that, I will I will accept it. But. Uh, No, but he specifically says here that you're born with divine qualities. No, but he's saying there's two types of people in the world. There's the, the devotees and the demons. So it's not only Arjuna is born with divine quality, other people also. You cannot say everyone is born equal, not. because okay. everyone ha everyone has a different karma. Everybody. Yes, that's true, and, li and everyone can make that choice, and that choice is not regulated by the laws of karma. I'll be right back.